Simon, and good evening. Good to see so many people involved, 74 at the moment, and still rising, which is great. Um, yeah, my name is Keith Betton. I'm the chairman of the Hampshire Ornithological Society, and I am delighted to be able to present this talk tonight. I'm really just going to go through about 50 species that you can see in the area around Winchester. Um, none of them are actually outstandingly rare. There's a couple that are actually quite uncommon, but they are mainly birds that you can see quite easily. And I'm going to give you a little bit of background on each of them and, um, and go from there. I think we're lucky to have such a wonderful wealth of wildlife around Winchester. The Itchin Valley offers so many opportunities to, to watch birds wonderful places like Winnell and, and further south, some of the woodlands that are near to Winchester are superb. And of course, you go a little bit further east towards Alsford, it's superb there as well. So um, I've done just a selection of birds. I've actually picked birds that are, um, and screen has now frozen. That's good, isn't it? Let's see if we can get it to move. There we go. I've picked some um, photographs from the internet. One or two of these are mine, but frankly, most of them are not. And I've picked them from free to use sources on the internet because I wanted you to have some nice, nice images rather than some of the ones I've maybe taken. So the robin, um, this is our national bird. It became our national bird in 1961. And actually a poll was held about five years ago to see if it still had that status and everybody had the chance to vote for whatever bird they wanted and the robin still went right to the top. One interesting thing about robins is that although we see them as birds in our gardens, in much of Europe, mainland Europe, they're actually a bird you find only really in woodland. They're not a garden bird at all there. And actually their behavior in woodland is much different. I mean, they, they don't come up to you in woodland. They, they generally go back and are retiring. So uh, it's really quite an honor for us to have the robin as such a friendly uh, and approachable bird. Um, the next one I wanted to show you, of course, is uh, just as, as popular, the blackbird. So popular, in fact, that when uh, people from Britain traveled to move to Australia and, and New Zealand uh, back in the 1850s and thereabouts, they took blackbirds with them and song thrushes because they wanted to be able to hear the sound of English bird song. Uh, and so now you can go into the botanical gardens in Melbourne, you can have blackbird and uh, and song thrush there, plus actually, I think chaffinch and uh, no, well, greenfinch and goldfinch, I think. I mean, that's amazing. Anyway, the blackbird, female on the on the left, uh, male on the right, a very common bird. Um, and actually, in almost any habitat, you get them even halfway up mountains sometimes. A really widespread bird in the UK, a member of the thrush family. And this is the song thrush. This is the one that you mostly would see perhaps in your garden, but they're nowhere near as common in gardens now as they were when I was a child. We used to have probably maybe one song thrush for every two blackbirds. And um, it wasn't a particularly big garden, but it, you know, you would get those sorts of numbers. Whereas now I very rarely see song thrush in the garden. So if you've got one in your garden, you're lucky. In the woodland areas though, they are doing still quite well. And I think actually what we've noticed really is that the overall population in the UK has declined. And because gardens are really a sort of secondary habitat for them, they've retreated back into the woodlands rather than being uh, as easily found in, in gardens. And this is the dunnock, um, also known as the hedge sparrow. It's not actually a member of the sparrow family. It's a member of a family called the Accenters, which mostly in around the world live on mountains. But this is ours, uh, the dunnock, and it's got an amazing sex life. Now there are birds in the world, quite a lot of birds that actually, where the male takes on more than one female and uh, will have two females at the same time on eggs. Now, from a bird's point of view, it's not being greedy. It's just the whole great idea that if you've got two females on lots of eggs, you're going to have twice as many chicks and the population is going to grow, um, especially in an area where there may not be very many males. But in the dunnock, it works the other way around. So what actually happens there is you have a male and a female, and the female actually has an extra male sometimes who helps out at the nest, brings food for her chicks. Uh, and actually, as a reward, she does mate with him. But and he doesn't know this, but she actually um, expels his sperm straight after he's mated with her so that actually he never becomes the father of any of her chicks. So quite a quite a clever um, bit of 
you know, e ecology going on there. Um, now, amongst the, um, the tit family, we have three different species. So the ones you're going to see on your feeders mostly are blue tit, grape tit, and the coal tit. So just go back to the blue tit. I think we all know that one. It's the smallest one um, that you get regularly on your feeders with the, the sort of blue. The interesting thing, though, if you look at any bird book, you never see the dark mark that they had on their breast. It's something that artists seem to overlook, but they've all got a little dark mark on their breast. The one that really does have a dark mark on the breast, though, is the great tit. And you can see it's got a, a thick um, black line down the, the middle. And you can actually tell male from female because the males have a much thicker black line than the females. And indeed, with the male, if you get the chance to see it, that black line goes right the way down between the legs, whereas on the female, it stops before that. And this is the cold tit, which has a little white patch on the top of the head, sort of almost like a head, head of a badger. Um, they mainly live in coniferous plantations. You don't see them that often, but if you're lucky, if you live near woodland, you may well get them on your bird table. And a real favourite with lots of people, the long-tailed tit. It's actually from a completely different group of um, birds. It is a tit, but it's, it's not related to the other ones I've just shown you in the same way. They're all together, but this one's different. And um, this has a, an amazing nest made of feathers, about 2,000 feathers, all stitched together with bits of moss. And the male makes that. In fact, he sometimes makes two because the female has a choice between one or another. And um, if you see one, you almost certainly see two. And if you see two, the chances are you might see as many as 10. Because in winter, the parents still keep their young with them and the family group goes around together. So you might have, um, for example, you might have a, a parent, uh, two parents, maybe five or six young birds from the summer, plus maybe a brother or sister from the family from the previous year. And because they hang around together, what actually happens is that the chicks from one year will help the parents the next year very often with feeding the young. Um, so they really do work as a team. It's very, very impressive. Something we didn't know until quite recently. Now, one of the commonest birds in gardens when I was young was the starling. But the starling is now declining really fast. It's actually now red listed. Uh, there's a choice of being red, amber or green. This one is red, I can assure you numbers are plummeting and we don't fully understand the reason for it. Uh, you do still see flocks of starlings flying around, big groups of maybe five or 10,000, but actually not only here, but also in Europe, their numbers are going down fast. Now it could be related to changes in agriculture, but it could also be something we don't yet fully understand. And the same is true actually of the house sparrow, a bird that again, I used to see in my garden in big numbers. Now, you know, when you see house sparrows, it's really quite a delight to hear them chattering away because it, you so often don't. And what we found out recently is that quite a lot of house sparrows suffer from something called avian malaria. And it's actually something that birds get regularly and they're able to survive it. But um, with the house sparrow, it's been shown that those birds that live in cities actually suffer from avian malaria more seriously. So actually they're more likely to die from it and not recover. It's also been shown that there is a link possibly between avian malaria survival or, or non-survival in this case and artificial light. So it may actually be that those that live in cities are doing worse because of maybe not being able to get as much sleep because there is artificial light all around them through the night. And sadly, this is another bird that's declining, the chaffinch. So we've got three finches that are quite commonly seen around. There's the chaffinch, there's the green finch, and there's the goldfinch. Now, all of these uh, you can see in your garden. Um, chaffinch, sadly, at the moment is declining. Um, I wouldn't say it's declining fast, but it is going down, and we're not quite sure why. The green finch is definitely declining. Now, this is um, declining because it gets an illness called trichomonosis, which um, basically gives them difficulty in, in breathing. You might have heard of it perhaps in uh, uh, game birds as something called canker. And it basically means at the back of their throat, they can't, they can't breathe as well. And as a result, I'm afraid many of them now die or they can't feed. So you probably notice greenfinch numbers have gone down. But goldfinch numbers have gone up. Now we don't really know why, but there are a lot more people feeding birds in their gardens now compared to say 30 years ago. 
And a lot of people use niger seed and goldfinches absolutely love niger seed. Now, if you've never used niger seed, it's little black tiny seeds. You need a special kind of feeder to supply them, but goldfinches absolutely love them. So it could be that that actually is what's, um, what's helping goldfinches. But whatever you do, do please keep your feeders clean because these birds can easily pick up disease from each other. I was actually thinking today, there's so many black and white birds actually around the world. I mean, you know, on the coast, oyster catchers and things like pied wagtails in your gardens. And well, this is the, the most obvious one, perhaps the magpie, although you can see here, it's actually black, white and blue. Not at all popular with many people because they do plunder young birds. So if you've got a pair of magpies in your garden in the summer, the chances are you're probably not gonna see many baby birds. Um, another bird that's very closely related, another member of the crow family is the jay. This one's more restricted really to woodlands, or if you've got a really big garden with woodlands nearby, you might see it. But it's not something you easily see in gardens uh, or in, in normal open spaces. Quite a shy bird, actually, the jay. And the commonest bird of the crow family we have, of course, is the carrion crow. Absolutely thousands of them everywhere. Um, I don't know why there are so many, but there really are. Um, and you can see huge flocks, not just those, but also rooks and jackdaws too. And um, we have probably too many crows at the moment for the good of our bird population because they do feed on other birds. So that's something to discuss maybe. Another incredibly common bird now is the wood pigeon. Um, when we look at um, counts of birds in winter inland, when we're doing any sort of surveys in, in Hampshire, uh, our host members report more wood pigeons than anything else. A lot of them come in from Europe in the winter because our climate's a little bit warmer than the climate in, in Europe, um, but we have an awful lot of them anyway. It's an incredibly common bird. Now, the collared dove has an interesting story because this is a bird that only arrived in Britain in 1955. The very first pair to nest was actually in Norfolk. And Basically, year by year, they've expanded out from the Middle East, where they're native, across Europe, across Eastern Europe, and then eventually Western Europe, and they arrive here. We don't really know why that sudden expansion happened. It's not like they were brought here by um, the Navy or anything. They, they literally did get here overland on their own. First pair to nest in Hampshire was on Hailing Island in 1961. And now, of course, you can see them pretty much anywhere in the county. Numbers, again, I'm afraid are declining, and the reason, again, is trichomonosis, this, this a disease that uh, I'm afraid several species of birds do get. But they are around, and I don't think they're going to disappear too quickly. Well, there are a number of woodpeckers that we can see, three species, but uh, the one that you're going to see commonly in your garden is the great spotted woodpecker, and it's gone through a huge population increase over the last 20, 30 years. We don't fully understand, and there is much more woodland now than actually any time in the last 250 years. So that might be part of it. It's been a lot of planting of trees, um, but it's also quite a predator. It feeds on some of the other smaller birds. So I don't know, it's hard to know uh, really why great spotted woodpeckers have done so well, but they certainly like coming to our feeders in our gardens. So this one's a summer migrant, the house martin. They nest on the undersides of eaves in uh, and houses. I'm afraid they do make a bit of a mess if you've got them, but they're an absolute delight to have. And this particular photo shows a house martin at an artificial nest. So although they will make a nest that looks quite like this, this one is fake. And what you get is the bird has come along and just finished off the last little bit. So they do actually get to make a bit of a nest, but they just seal up the hole and go in and lay their eggs. Uh, if you actually want to have house martins or you used to have them and you don't have them now or your neighbor's got them and you haven't then putting up some house martin um well i'll call them a nest box for the sake of it um is a good idea you can buy those online and you might have a good chance of getting them back so a couple of things about house martin that are really interesting first one is that they have two broods of chicks each summer so they arrive in april first brood appears quite quickly they hatch very very quickly indeed but you know, those babies from the first brood, they stick around and they help the male and female with feeding the second brood chicks. And then they all migrate off down to Africa. So that's a little bit of cooperative breeding, which I think is superb. The other thing that's amazing about house martins is that, you know, we ring 
hundreds and hundreds of these by putting a little bands on their feet so we can if we retrap them or they appear somewhere we know where they've come from and where they've gone to so despite the fact that thousands and thousands of these have been ringed only 15 have been seen in africa but with rings now i travel quite a lot in africa and i've probably only seen house martin on about i think half a dozen occasions we know that something like 10 or 15 million house martins go to Africa every year. We know that because we see them going across the Mediterranean. But once they're there, we have no idea where they go. By comparison, the next bird, which is, uh, oh no, not this bird, but the swallow, which is coming up later, um, that I think we've had over 550 recoveries of rings just from South Africa. So house martins are a bit of a mystery. Yeah, the swift. Now that's another bird you can help because swift numbers have declined a lot. 50% um, down since the 1990s and partly down to the fact that, you know, we have got this obsession with renovating our roofs and, uh, you know, churches I've noticed in the last few years have been spending a lot of money on renovating their roofs. So if we can actually put swift boxes or indeed swift bricks where a brick has a hole inside it so that the swift can nest in it, that will really help the population of swifts. Uh, there's also probably a decline in the number of insects they can eat. We all know how few insects there are compared to when we were children, but um, we can do quite a lot to help the swifts. Now we've got three birds that are small and um, the three smallest birds in Britain. So we've got the wren, which people always used to say they thought was the smallest bird in Britain, but it is not. And we've got the gold crest, and then a few years ago, we got this, the firecrest. So I'm going to tell you about all of these. So start with the wren. Um, yeah, it's actually our commonest breeding bird. Um, it's, it's astonishing, really. There's something like 10 million pairs of wrens in Britain. They take up almost every kind of habitat you can imagine. They have quite small territories because they're small birds, and they really do very well indeed. And they'll have two broods every year, so they get lots of chicks away. So a common bird, and it's doing well. The goldcrest is, a, is a, a smaller bird, it's probably about a third smaller than the wren, and it lives basically in coniferous plantations. Now you will get them in winter, one, wandering away from those, but if you want to see a goldcrest, go to um, even just a small group of pine trees. You, you know, look for a little bird hopping about and look for that little golden crest. The male's got a much brighter crest than the female. Now a very similar bird, I'll just flash between the two now, this is the firecrest. So again, it's got a really beautiful fiery crest, but it's got a black surround to the fiery bit, and it's got a white surround to the black bit. If I just go back to the gold crest. Well, it has a bit of that, but it's really nothing like as a substantial. So you've got to look at that big white eyebrow. Now, Hampshire has a, a big part to play actually in the, in the fire crest's life because the very first fire crest to nest in Britain was in 1961. This is a species really of the Mediterranean that's moved up through France as the climate has warmed. They arrived here, let's say, in 61 in the New Forest, very first pair, and now they're nesting right across uh, England and in Wales as well. They don't really make it up to Scotland, it's not quite warm enough for them yet, but give it 10 years, I expect they'll be warm enough there too. So in Hampshire, we've got at least 2,000 pairs of fire crests now, and, and quite frankly, it could be double that. They, they pack themselves in. In incredible numbers. And you may not see them quite so easily um, in the garden, but if you are in somewhere like New Forest, somewhere like Boulderwood, if you know the Boulderwood car park, or in fact any of the New Forest woodlands, um, listen for really high pitched uh, sound from them and, uh, and look for that bird, the firecrest. So we've got a couple of birds that specialize in going up and down trees. Um, this is the nuthatch, which you'll also see on your bird table. And here's the tree creeper which is a, a really secretive bird. I, I miss these all the time. They've got a little squeaky sound, which I can barely hear now. Um, and, you know, they're the same color as the bark. They hide very well. Nuthatch then. Well, that's the one that's going to be um, hanging upside down on maybe your bird table, grabbing some food away. They're quite aggressive. Coming down a tree like that. Now, that's one thing that a tree creeper can't do. Tree creepers can only go up trees. When they get to the top, they have to then fly down and start again, whereas the nuthatch can run up and down. So that's the, the main difference between those. 
The tree creeper actually nests in old trees like this one here you can see uh, with the bark where it can maybe squeeze in and uh, it can actually roost in that bark. It, it, they'll squeeze themselves in to keep themselves warm, but they'll nest in small holes in there too. Oh, another white, black and white bird, the pied wagtail. Um, this is uh, a bird that we've seen quite a bit around Winchester. You may recall that um, uh, there have been quite good numbers down at Winnell. I think there's somewhere nearby where they must be roosting. They roost in the, in the evenings in good numbers. You get, um, you know, 100 or so maybe in greenhouses and uh, big commercial greenhouses. And if you've got something like a um, shopping center where there's quite a lot of lighting on, a little bit warmer than the surrounding countryside, pied wagtails love that and they'll sit in the trees. Maybe you saw the, I think it was somewhere near Bristol where they had um, a load of pied wagtails actually in a, in a Christmas tree. Fantastic, in the middle of the town. There's another wagtail which you can see around Winchester, but you're going to see this one down maybe on the Itchin uh, or somewhere on one of the tributaries, the grey wagtail. It's not the best name perhaps for this bird because really frankly it's yellow, isn't it? But we have a yellow wagtail as well, so whoever did the naming got this wrong. Um, they should have called the yellow wagtail something else. But this is a very yellow bird. That's a male with a black throat. The female has got a white throat. In fact, interestingly, just to confuse everybody, the male loses his black throat in the winter. So we don't know what we're looking at when it comes to winter. They all look the same. But a delightful bird, um, hops from rock to rock on small screens and things like that. Really nice to see. Now we do quite well for birds of prey. We've got several of them. I'll just quickly show you them now. We've got buzzard, we've got red kite, of course, we've got the kestrel, we've got sparrowhawk, and we've got the peregrine. So let's just go back through these. The buzzard actually, until about 30 years ago, buzzard was really quite scarce. There were a few in the New Forest, but mainly they were west of Hampshire. They were doing well in Dorset and places like that. But they are now just everywhere. And I think it's really linked with the big increase in the release of things like pheasants and partridges for shooting. There's quite a lot of those birds that get shot, they don't actually get collected, or they die uh, a, a miserable quiet death somewhere and the buzzard comes along and picks them up. So buzzards are having an easy time of it. The red kite is a bird that we had in the 1800s. In fact, the last pair to nest in Hampshire at that time was in 1864 in Broughton in the Test Valley. They became exterminated right across England, uh, most of Scotland, uh, until eventually they went from Scotland. And the only ones left were actually in Wales. So to try and get the population back up again, because the Welsh birds just didn't go anywhere. They stayed in a very confined area of, of Wales. Um, plus they were all related to each other. So you had a sort of weird mixture where uh, brothers and sisters were, you know, uh, breeding together and so on. Not great. Um, but anyway, uh, they brought in birds in 1989 from Spain and from Germany, and these were chicks, and they were released in Chilterns. And eventually, and by the way, they made a big, big careful choice not to take brothers and sisters. Um, when these birds then were old enough to breed at two years old, uh, they did start breeding, and bit by bit, this population has expanded, and we've now got them all over Hampshire. We recently did a count actually across 15 different roosts because they roost in the winter together. And we had 650 and that's only some of the roosts. So the population in Hampshire is probably something like 2000 birds in total. So I like them. I think, I think they're much more interesting than buzzards as you can tell, because I've talked about them for a good four minutes and I gave the buzzard 30 seconds. But there we are, buzzard again. Right, next one is the kestrel, which I must admit, as a kid, I used to see by every motorway when we were going on holiday, I used to see them and I'd count the number of kestrels. You just don't see kestrels by motorways now. They used to hover right by the verge to pick up small mammals and things like that. I think it's a real indication of how many fewer mammals there are, small mammals. Um, but the kestrel is still reasonably common in our countryside and you should be able to see them if you go out across a bit of farmland, watching them hovering. They fly straight into the wind at exactly the same speed as the wind. But one thing that people don't always realize about kestrels is that they're looking for a mouse and you know, people think they're looking for the movement of the mouse, but actually they can see uh, mouse urine. And the reason they can see it is because they have the ability to see ultraviolet light and urine on the ground shows up to a kestrel, uh, a different color to the ground. And they're able to therefore track mice as they go 
through the grass. Um, mice are actually fairly incontinent. In fact, what they do is they're scent marking as they move around. So the kestrel is watching for that little, that little P mark. As soon as it sees that, it'll go down closer and then eventually it'll, it'll pounce on, on the mouse. Sparrowhawk is a bird that uh, we see a lot more of now. I'm, I'm getting so many reports now from Winchester Gardens. These are birds that originally really were deep forest birds. They didn't come into gardens very often. But you know, we feed birds so much more than we used to, and it's easy pickings for the sparrowhawk just to come through, swoop through and, and grab a bird off the bird table. So we're seeing more of them now in gardens than we did uh, before, and we're now seeing fewer of them in places like the New Forest than we did before. Part of the reason for that is that they're very much up against goshawks. Now, I didn't put a photo in, but a goshawk is about twice the size, and they will not tolerate sparrowhawks in their territory. So goshawks, I'm afraid, are the bullies. They get rid of the sparrowhawks. We see more goshawks now than sparrowhawks in the New Forest. But if you have a bird that's uh, basically plucked something on your lawn, it's going to be a sparrowhawk. I quite often get people saying to me, oh, I've had a peregrine on my lawn. It won't be. Peregrines don't go on lawns. That's always a sparrowhawk. Um, and you can see they've got beautiful yellow eye. Here's the peregrine. It's not got a yellow eye. It's got a black eye. And this indeed, this very, very bird is a, is a lady called Winnie. And I photographed her a couple of years ago. Winnie is the female peregrine that we have nesting in the middle of Winchester. She's been around since at least 2011. And initially she was nesting on the old police HQ in Romsey Road that got knocked down. And then when that uh, was demolished, she decided to move on to Winchester Cathedral and she nests every year just below where the rose window is on the north side. And um, a couple of years ago in 2018, I've got a tray put in there for her so she can nest on that and um, she's nested every year and, and reared chicks. And if you haven't seen it um, in the spring, go to the Winchester Cathedral website and have a look at the camera. It's amazing. There's a quarter of a million people every summer that watch this pair of peregrines all around the world. Uh, that is Winnie and Chester, by the way. Um, we don't quite know where Chester is at the moment. I don't know anybody who's seen him recently. And of course, it's a bit difficult to go down and check on that. But you know, even if Chester has, I'm afraid, uh, you know, if, if it's if it, his time has been called, um, there are plenty of other peregrines around. So, so Winnie is unlikely to be alone for long, if indeed uh, she is. And she's a fantastic looking bird. She really is. I'll give another talk maybe on peregrines later in the season when, uh, when all of that's happening. Right, moving on, pheasants. Well, back in the, uh, back in the sort of 1800s, pheasants were really quite scarce. It's only really just after that that people started to think it was good fun to shoot them, and so they started releasing them. And now, um, actually, something like 35 million pheasants are released by gamekeepers every single year. So it's a very common bird now in our, in our uh, countryside. In fact, if you just thought about the 35 million pheasants added together, the amount of biomass in the bird world is mostly pheasants now, which is quite amazing in Britain. They're not British. They actually came originally from China, brought here about, uh, or just about a thousand years ago now, or just under. And uh, yeah, so they're not a native bird. And, and neither is this. This is the red-legged partridge, which you probably may know is, is also known as the French partridge by uh, gamekeepers. It's a bird traditionally from Europe, uh, mainly brought over from France. 10 million of those are released every year. So we see an awful lot of those um, and a lot of them get shot, of course, most of them. Uh, but there are still a few around. I've seen them the last few weeks. The grey partridge, which I haven't put into this talk, has pretty much vanished now from all the farms. It's just a few examples where they are very sad. It's our native partridge and, and known by gamekeepers as the English partridge. Well, I mentioned the great spotted woodpecker earlier. This is the green woodpecker, and this is a bird that you're going to find mostly on the ground. I mean, they do go in trees, of course, they nest in trees, but they feed on the ground mostly and they go into fields with ant hills and they have a very, very long sticky tongue inside the head. It's actually coiled up like a spring and they can stick this tongue out, which is about twice as long as the length of the beak. And that will then extract the, uh, the ants from the ant hill. And they all end up sticking to the tongue. Um, 
so that's it. Yeah, the green woodpecker, known as the yaffle. Uh, I do remember one of the kids' programs used to have yaffle, the woodpecker. And it's got that name from the call that it makes, which is very much a laughing sound. Very nice bird, the green woodpecker. Always a delight to see one. They're a little bit skittish and not like the great spotted woodpecker, which pretty much is bomb proof. You know, they, they will fly off as soon as they see you. Um, and uh, the other thing about them that you might not know is they don't drum. So when you hear a woodpecker drumming, it's going to be either a great spotted woodpecker, which is going to be something like 99 times out of 100. And then once out of 100, you might hear a lesser spotted. But green woodpeckers don't drum. They just tap. Tawny owl. Well, we've got a couple of owls or three owls that we're going to see regularly around the Winchester area. The tawny owl is the commonest of those. It's the traditional sort of to it to woo owl that you hear at night in woodland or in parkland. Um, I think it is declining a little bit, but there are still lots of them around in Hampshire. And I've been looking for them the last you know, few weeks and found really quite a lot. So um, I don't think there's a problem around here anyway with tawny owls. Uh, but there is a bit of a problem with a little owl, and that is a much smaller bird. Here's one I photographed just the other day on a, on a roof near where I live in a farm. And, you know, it's got um, a, a much thinner distribution, I should think, whereas there are probably, I'm going to guess, two or three thousand pairs of tawny owls in Hampshire. There's probably less than two or three hundred pairs of little owls. They are mainly insect eaters. And so the decline of insects is going to be something affecting them. And the insects they eat are mainly on the ground. So they're taking beetles and things like that. And they're well known for look, walking around on the ground at night, and looking at things like cow pats and so on, trying to find insects that might be in that. When I was a kid, if you kicked over a cow pat, it was just crawling with insects. Um, but now if you kick over a cow pat, you just get a dirty shoe. There's no insects at all. Um, there are so many veterinary products that are being used now that uh, they, they kill off the insects. So little owls probably suffering from that more than anything else. And the barn owl is such a delight to see. We don't see them very often because they are really um, out at night. They're not, they're not the sort of bird that likes to come out in daylight. They occasionally do when they've got young to feed or if they're particularly hungry. But, um, you know, I think it's a very under-recorded bird. There are probably quite a lot of barn owls around that we just never see. I went to one farm, um, no, not near Winchester, but near Andover, and I talked to the farmer and I said, I see you have a barn owl box. He said, oh yeah, I've actually got seven. I said, oh, how many barn owls have you got? And he said, I've got barn owls in every single one of them. So they, they can do well. So lots of barn owl boxes up, probably a couple of thousand barn owl boxes in Hampshire. It's incredible. And, uh, and as a result, we have plenty of them, which is really good. So I mentioned the swallow earlier. Yeah, they come here in the spring. They're on our farmlands. Quite amazing how they're able to navigate all the way from a shed in a farm right the way down to South Africa and all the way back again, straight back to that shed. Um, it's probably worth another talk, but basically birds are able to navigate with that degree of accuracy and it really is impressive. More accurate than, than aeroplanes, frankly. Uh, yeah, I'd like to see the swallows. They are doing quite well still, although, you know, along with other birds that specialise in insects, they, they perhaps have got um, a limit on their numbers compared to the old days. Skylark, um, a wonderful bird to hear. The skylark um, is still doing okay. They're, they're not as many as there were, partly because of the you know, farmland mechanism. The, the thing you can do if you're a farmer and you're, you're listening to this talk, one of the best things you can do is when you're actually drilling your field, putting seed in, is just to switch the drill off for a moment every, I don't know, every 10 seconds or so. And that'll actually leave a thin patch or a bare patch in your field. And a skylark can nest in that. And that's a great thing you can do uh, if you're able to, it really does help them. They need bare ground. Grey heron. The common heron that we see, uh, if you've got fish in a, in, a, in a fish pond, you'll probably know this bird. There are about, uh, I don't know, 12, 15 different heronries in Hampshire. There's probably quite a few we don't know about because they, you know, there, I, I'm seeing herons all the time. We think there are probably a couple of hundred to 250 pairs of grey herons in Hampshire. But they can go undetected. There's actually a heronry right next to the M3 just 50 metres from the M3 that was undetected for 40 years. 
incredible. I mean, say it was undetected for 40 years. Somebody knew about it 40 years ago and we went and checked and it was still there. Amazing. Now amongst the herons, there are a couple that you will see now more and more. So the smaller of the two here is the little egret. And little egrets arrived in 1989 from France. They are a well-known common Mediterranean species, but in Britain, they were incredibly rare. Um, real highlight when one would turn up, but then about a hundred turned up in one go and they stayed. And now they're breeding in amongst the gray herons in some of our heronries. And then the same thing has happened with this big brother, the great white egret with this huge yellow dagger-like beak that arrived. Well, the first one arrived about 20 years ago and there was just one. And I think now there's probably something like 10 or 20 in Hampshire at any time. Um, Fish Lake Meadows, for example, down near Romsey is a very good place to see them. I know they've been at Winnell. I saw a fantastic photo earlier on that somebody put up where they saw one somewhere up the Test Valley. So yeah, um, great white egret, big yellow beak, worth looking out for. If you see a, a small one with a yellow beak, the same size as the little egret, then that'll be a cattle egret. Um, but that's a story for another day. That's another colonizer that's just arriving. Kingfisher, well, they're actually commoner than you think. Perhaps they're small, uh, very unobtrusive. I walk along uh, the Basingstoke Canal near to where I live, and you know, I saw a whole load of them. I saw four of them at Christmas time. Um, but I saw other people walking. Nobody spotted the kingfisher. I went and said to them, "Did you see the kingfisher?" No. You know, they're, they're easy to miss. But um, they're doing okay. There are quite a lot of them around. They just need um, nesting banks, and there's plenty of those up the itchin. So I think uh, no problem with our kingfisher population. Plenty of mute swans as well. Um, a native bird, one that uh, you know has been here for many, many years. But this one is one that got brought here. This is the Canada goose. And indeed it is from Canada, brought over in uh, the 17th century. First pairs were released in St. James's Park because they were given to the king. And uh, as a result, we've now got something like 60,000 pairs in Britain. So. And they're all descended from the, the ones in St. James's Park, basically. They are a bit of a problem now, a bit noisy, uh, and, and frankly, a bit of a pest in one or two places. Mallard, well, our common duck, the male on the left, female on the right, one that you'll see just about everywhere. One thing you might not know, though, is that at the end of the breeding season, the male loses all those beautiful green and gray feathers and ends up looking just like the female on the right. The only difference is that he's got a yellow beak and she's got an orange beak. So in, make a note in your diary now, around about August, have a look for the mallards, see how many you can see with a green head, you won't see any. Uh, so it's almost like all the males have vanished, but they all basically dress as females for a bit. And the reason is they don't have good flight feathers at that time, they lose all the flight feathers and they don't want to be particularly obvious. Now, if you're really gaudy with a green, shiny head, you know, maybe you're going to be attacked by something. Whereas if you end up looking like a female who's designed to be difficult to see because she's got to sit on a nest, then uh, you've got a less chance of getting caught. Moorhen with a red and yellow beak, one of the two um, rail and uh, species you get along our, our, um, our rivers and canals. And this one's the other one, the coot with just a completely white beak. So there are plenty of those around. They, they nest on lots of places um, up and down the rivers. And um, the last bird I want to show you is the little green. It's a really special little bird. You'll find it at Winnell in one or two places. They only go for bits of river that are clean. So there are quite a few up the itchin, which is nice. Uh, and this is a bird that, um, again, like the coo to the moorhen, drags bits of weed and so on and makes a nest that uh, is on top of the water and floats and it's actually it's actually tethered so that it can't drift off but it's also not tethered totally so that it can rise up and down as the water level rises so you know birds never cease to amaze me how they come up with these adapt adaptations so if you want information about birds uh, where do you go Hampshire Ornithological Society we have a website which is um, hoss.org.uk I'm sure many of you have seen it before Lots of information on there every day. There's information about where birds are on the right hand side and there's articles. We've now got a whole series of talks like this one. Uh, indeed, this talk will be on there later, perhaps later this evening even. Um, so host.org.uk, 
is our website. If you join HOSS, which I hope you'll consider, you'll get the Kingfisher magazine three times a year, which is a fantastic magazine, about 60 pages of stories and information, latest news. You'll get the Hampshire Bird Report once a year, which is about 250 pages, um, and it's 16 pounds. The other thing I wanted to mention to you is this book, the Hampshire Bird Atlas, which is the best source of information about where to look and what to see. It's based on a survey we did a few years ago now, uh, and because of that, we've reduced the price from £35 to £25 just to get the last 100 or so copies sold. It's a super book. I mean, proper A4 size, really glossy, lovely double page formats with maps of distribution and articles and graphs and so on. So everything you want. So what I was going to say is that if you, as a result of this talk, um, decide to join HOSS, which I hope you do, um, then we'll do a special offer for you, which is you can have that atlas for £15 instead of £25. Um, and if you would like to do that, uh, we'd, we'd love to have you in membership. Brian Coates will take care of that if you would like to, uh, to do that combined offer. And uh, his email address is there. If you just want to join HOSS, you can go to our website. If you just want to buy the atlas, you can do that from the, the website too. So uh, that's the commercial bit over and done with. Um, and I will hand back to Barry, who I know has got some questions uh, and you may maybe some new ones that you've put in the last few minutes. So Barry, over to you. Thanks, Keith. Uh, yeah, a few that were posted before, and I can see one or two that have come in. Um, so let's start with feeding garden birds. Um, and there's a question that came in, which was around how reliant of, uh, of our garden birds become on the feeding that we, you know, that there was, that's put out for them, and what would be the implications if we stopped? Believe it or not, my, uh, my earpiece is just completely packed up. Uh, let me just... Hang on a sec. Bear with me one second. I'm going to get a proper pair of headphones. That's what you get for buying a cheap piece of technology. I do right. like that it appeared that you were coming back from the jungle there, Keith. <laughs> Very effective, wasn't it? Simon? Absolutely. Right. <laughs> Can you hear me? We can, Keith. Yes, Shall sorry. I repeat the question? Right, what was the question? Sorry. The question was around feeding birds in our garden, Keith, which was a uh, question effectively is around how reliant of, of birds become on the feeding that we uh, we, we, we give in our gardens. And, and, and conversely, um, if we stopped, you know, would, would, they, uh, would, would they significantly suffer? Yeah, I think the answer is that they are reliant on our feeding, particularly, uh, you know, you shouldn't really feed them in the summer. I think that's... Um, that's not a good idea, partly because they will end up giving their, their chicks seed and, and stuff like that, when actually what they need to be doing is giving their chicks insects, which will give them the nourishment they need. Um, and it's not a bad thing to feed birds in the garden. And a time like now, when it's been quite cold the last few days, I bet they really appreciate it. But you don't need to do it the whole time, and you certainly shouldn't do it. Uh, supplementary question, um, specific to tits, I mean, any, any, any advice on, on what's best to feed tits to attract them to a garden? So a specific question on, on attracting tits. Yep, uh, well, peanuts and things like that, but don't put out salted peanuts, as a friend of mine did, uh, because salt is lethal to birds, will kill all the birds in your garden. So, um, yeah, put out, put out uh, peanuts for them. And, uh, I mean, a whole variety of foods for the birds in the garden, seeds, uh, niger seeds, sunflower hearts, that sort of thing. It's all quite nice to have a few of everything. Uh, one, I think it's more of a passing comment, but uh, one question was uh, the uh, whole topic of, of bird song. I think that's probably one for another for another specific uh, talk, sure. Keith, because of a huge Yeah, we we'll could do a but... talk on bird song. Uh, so maybe one to pick up with Simon for, for another time in terms of bird song. Yeah. Um, Back to our peregrines, a question that, that was posed earlier, which was um, possibility of seeing more than one, uh, more than Winnie uh, nesting at the cathedral. Would, uh, would, uh, would Winnie, uh, <laughs> I think you, you might have see that. your head. <laughs> Winnie would see amazing. all. Well, apart from the fact she's huge, um, I mean, she's twice the size of the male, um, but she just would see off any other peregrines. They will nest um, about a mile and a half apart. 
and and they do because of that they do have to fly over other peregrines territories and i think they kind of accept that they have to do that so they don't get too upset if a peregrine shoots straight over but if you come down anywhere near uh, uh, the nest no there, there would be no room for two whinnies uh, switching, and this is a broad one, and something you and I have covered on on, on other talks. But uh, what are some of the best best sites in Hampshire um, for birds? In terms of if anyone tonight is interested to kind of go out and, and try and see a broader range of birds, and on most of the ones you've spot, you've covered tonight, where are some of the best spots in Hampshire? Sure. Well, you can go if you go to the host website. There's a whole directory of sites that you can go to. So uh, when we're out the back end of COVID, you can get to the coast places like Keyhaven and Pennington, that lovely coastline there from Hurst Spit all the way to Lymington. Um, a lot of really nice coastal habitat. At the other end of the county, uh, Hailing Island that you've got, you've got Farlington Marshes and Langston Harbour, very nice nature reserves like Titchfield Haven. Um, all of those are good on the coast. I mean, I personally love the downlands. I love going to places like Old Winchester Hill and Butser Hill and Cheesefoot Head, such a variety of good birds. I mean, near Winchester, Cheesefoot Head's a good place to go because it's got corn buntings and yellow hammers and uh, just a, a great place to go for a, a nice circular walk. Uh, I think this one's about uh, perhaps one could get into apps and available uh, other means, but uh, anything you'd uh, suggest in terms of resources to help recognise birdsong? I know there's a, a, any number of yeah. apps that are starting but any anyway, you'd suggest yeah I, well i use the um for so as a book i use the collins bird guide and you can get the collins bird guide as an app on your phone and i think it's something like 14 pounds and apart from having all the pages of the book in which you can search very quickly it's got the sounds as well so if you've got that on your phone you know hearing a bird singing you could quickly do a quick comparison um keeping the volume down so not to uh, not to upset the bird and you'd actually hopefully hear um hear the same sound or not uh, a different topic keith i know one that uh, we've certainly discussed um in hoz is actually uh, wildlife photography and particularly focused on birds uh the impact that it has um you know obviously it's great to capture uh some great images and you've shown some tonight but uh, there are some concerns uh, about the impact that it can have uh, on, on some of our birds any, any comments you'd, you'd be keen to share or willing to share around the impact that yeah. uh, photography can have? well you know the phrase all the gear and no idea um, uh, you know there are some people who absolutely understand that birds and wildlife should come first and there are some people who absolutely don't understand it and put themselves first in trying to get a photograph. Um, generally speaking, I don't think photography does impact birds uh, across the board, but I do think there are individuals um, that get absolutely hassled. I mean, there are sometimes you find, I know one place there's a kingfisher that sits on one particular stump and there's, you know, photographers just waiting for it the whole time. And they, some of them go nearer and nearer and nearer. I mean, why? Because, you know, I mean, the bird is just there. You don't have to get a better shot than your mate. By the way, that's not in Winchester, I might add. Um, but generally, I don't think photography is a negative thing, but we all know people who do stupid things, I'm afraid. And all of us who take photographs. And I mean, I, every year I nearly end up in a fight because I pull someone back and tell them they're being an idiot. Uh, what about jackdaws in the St. Cross area? Um, I don't know my per personally, but uh, apparently there's a significant number of them. Uh, causing problems for other smaller birds? Are they discouraging birds from uh, bird feeders, etc.? Well, jackdaws, jackdaws, yeah, they're, they're, they're a bit of a menace because they, they, they go around in gangs. Um, they're quite timid, actually, and it's single jackdaws, like, terrified. But, I mean, as soon as they get four or five of them, they get, they get quite bold. Um, so yeah, they can be a bit boisterous on the bird table, pushing everybody else off, typical crows. Um, and they definitely can affect other birds. We have constant battles going on between whole nesting birds like tawny owls and stock doves with jackdaws. Jackdaws are quite pushy. They quite often get in there first, steal other birds' nesting holes, or indeed try and take them over once they're in there. So yeah, they're not very nice and there are yeah, probably too many of them. There are probably too many crows full stop, I'm afraid, at the moment. It's, a, you know, probably a, a sign of the availability of 
non-natural food such as dead game birds and so on left in fields and that probably is also driving up the fox population at the moment I think. Switching to another four-legged predator on, on our birds, um, any thoughts around impact that cats, domestic cats, have um, on, on our birds and our gardens, particularly in Yeah, uh, I mean, there are millions of cats. Um, but I think an individual, I mean, cats on, on the whole, I don't think have a significant impact across the whole of the UK, just as I don't think a magpie, the magpie population does on its own. But um, if you've got a cat in a garden, then it's a bit like having a pair of magpies in a garden. You, you will probably suffer. Um, and certainly it's one of the things that um, birds have to put up with. So some birds have made the decision to move into gardens to benefit from the availability of food that we give them. But the price they pay for that is that they then face all kinds of other risks. So they face cats for the very first time, never having seen them before. They face cars. I mean, in woodlands, they don't get hit by cars, but as soon as they move into towns and villages, they get hit by cars. So there's a sort of plus and minus. I don't think cats overall have a major impact on the bird population, but I know there are people who disagree with me. And I think the last one I've spotted, Keith, there was switching back to your point around feeding birds and, and, and not feeding during the, during the summer months. The, what's the range of months which you would you know, define as being in that summer month from, from when to when? I'd probably put food out from, say, November through till February, March. OK, OK. Um, and, and put water out as well. Birds need water probably more than they need food at certain times. I mean, they can probably find food in the winter, but finding water can be really hard for them and they need it. I'll just pause us any more questions. I think I've covered them all. There was one I remember seeing about um, feeding birds in Australia. I think a lady had lived in Australia uh, and she, uh, yeah, that, said that, she was told never to feed the birds by her mum. Yeah, that was the one connected to the impact that um, yeah. feeding here has. So it was a connection. Yeah, I, I, I dropped off the actual. Uh, yeah, so the, the interesting thing about that is that in Australia, there's quite a different view about feeding birds. So in Britain and in America, People feed birds, spend millions of pounds feeding birds every year. And there are companies that just exist to supply bird food and nothing else. In Australia, it's frowned upon, uh, as indeed uh, encouraging non-native birds is, is frowned upon too. So uh, there's a very different approach. People don't really go feeding birds. And if you travel around Europe, you'll find they don't really have the bird feeding frenzy that we have either. So in most, most countries, France, Germany and whatever, bird feeding, if you wanted to try and find a bird table in a garden centre, you'd probably have to hunt quite hard for it. Uh, that's it on the question uh, front. Uh, oh, no, there's one about barn owls come in. Um, what's the uh, question? What is the best way to monitor nest boxes? The best way to monitor nest boxes is to work with someone who is a licensed barn owl um, surveyor. So someone like Matt Stevens at the Hawk Conservancy up at Wayhill, he's, he monitors a lot of nest boxes, probably two or three hundred every year. Um, if it's just on your land and you've got a, a, a box, you, you've got to be quite careful about visiting this uh, because this is a schedule one bird under the law. So if you did something which disturbed them and caused them to fail, technically you'd be really in breach of the law. Um, but at the end of the season, good idea to clean out the box. They nest right up until August, September. So leave it until the winter, clean out the box. Um, uh, and just, you know, because quite often there are things like dead owl chicks in there. Uh, good idea to clean them out and get it ready for the next year. Um, you can put up a camera. Um, in the box. That's a good way of doing it. There are plenty of owl boxes now where there's a camera included. Uh, you could do that or or just watch from a distance, you know, but don't go too close because they're, you know, they are a protected species. Okay. Uh, I think we're coming up to the hour and, and a number of comments suggesting people might be coming to the end of their talk as uh, the end of their hour as well. Simon, I'm probably going to pass back to you to, uh, to, to, fi to finish up. So let me just change the... Uh, speak of you and Simon you should be able to uh, to finish off. Well, thank you very much. Thank you first off Barry for being gatekeeper tonight and keeping us all in check. Uh, secondly thanks to Keith. Um, lots of comments about how much people have enjoyed tonight and certainly we have here. Uh, it's uh, been really informative and uh, 
so thank you so much. I do think that you've stitched yourself up for doing a bird song uh, talk though, because we're getting an awful lot of things coming up here saying about how uh, yeah, how everyone would really like the bird song talk. So it sounds like that's in the books already. Um, okay. So yeah, given the success of this, yeah, absolutely we'll try and do more. Um, certainly we'd love to have you back Keith again and for everyone else we will be looking at trying to get another couple of guest speakers over the next few months as well so thank you very much everyone for attending and particularly Hoss for setting this up and Keith. Okay well it's been a real pleasure this by the way um, is the app that I mentioned to you and here's a nightingale to finish. Sadly, a sound we don't hear very much in Hampshire these days. Um, pleasure giving you the talk tonight. Great to see so many people. Um, and uh, hope you, some of you will join Hoss or buy the book or both. Be uh, great to see you in the future if you do. Thanks very much indeed, everybody, for joining us. Perfect. Thank you, everyone.